Thank you so much um, for that lovely introduction, Michael. And it's really lovely to see everybody here tonight. Um, it's pretty um, amazing just um, to be celebrating um, Mark Ashton today. I was checking Twitter earlier on and um, Mark's name was number 30 on the most tweeted topics in Northern Ireland. Um, and lots and lots of people from around uh, the country and actually internationally have have been marking um, what, what should have been Mark's birthday. Um, so really, um, I'm sort of here by accident. Um, I began a petition on the anniversary of Mark's death, which was the 11th of February. And since then, um, almost 30,000 people have signed a petition asking the local council and the Ulster History Circle to install a blue plaque for Mark Ashton in Portrush, where he grew up. He was born in Oldham and moved to Portrush whenever he was a baby. And he lived there for most, most of his life, um, leaving there for what was supposed to be originally Liverpool, but it ended up being London in 1978, around that time. And sort of just casting back to that time, that was obviously um, before the Dudgeon and the UK judgment, um, which decriminalised male homosexuality between consenting adults. So the country that Mark left, was he was a criminal. Um, it, it wasn't possible for him to live his authentic self, as, as we now call it. Um, and thanks to the campaign, I have met some really, really wonderful people and I'm really pleased to have um, some of them here today. Um, we have amazingly um, Mike Jackson, um, who was the co-founder of LGSM and who is like out doing us with a massive plaque um, in the background. Um, if you give us a wee wave, Mike. So Mike co-founded Lesbians and Gays Support the Minors, and he's also portrayed in the film Pride um, as a lumpy, uh, lumpy jumper wearing um, accountant type. And, you know, I couldn't possibly comment on the jumpers, um, but he has definitely kept me right with this campaign. So thank you so much. We also have Hilary McCollum, uh, who is a writer who knew Mark um, from his days in Portrush. Um, I, I think I'll probably specifically be asking about whether or not he knew how to make 15s and what recipes he actually learned at the Catering College um, and some other points, but Hilary's a writer and knew Mark, so she'll be giving us some uh, reflections on his life and legacy there. We also have, and um, I'm just concerned now at the amount of time that we have because Shan James is Welsh and I think she is, she can probably talk for Wales. She's beautifully portrayed in Pride the movie as an obstreperous um, wife of a minor. Um, Shan has an amazing um, background of um, advocacy. Um, she has had a number of um, regenerations, I don't know how to put it. Um, she has represented her um, electorate in Westminster and continues to represent people through her advocacy work. So, and um, then Richard Coles is due to join us at some point, so I'll, I'll introduce him then. Um, I think maybe just turning first to Hilary, um, I kind of want to hear a little bit about what Mark, what what Port Rush was like um, growing up at the time of Mark, and you know your memories of Mark from that period. Well, I can tell you a bit about Port Rush at that time, but I actually didn't know Mark until after he'd left and after I'd left. Um, I was actually going to start with a story about Mark. So I knew of Mark before I knew him. So he was a bit older than me, so five, five years older than me. Uh, and by the time I'd started going out, he was already gone. But I knew people that knew, knew him. And I heard this story about him, which I don't know necessarily whether it's true. But having met Mark, I kind of think it is very likely to be true. So there's a club in Portrush called Kelly's. 
which I think is probably still there, but certainly was doing the big guns when I was a girl. Um, and apparently Mark went to Kelly's wearing a red miniskirt. So this would have been the late 1970s and they wouldn't let him in. And a young woman was getting what well, she arrived at a similar time and she was let in and she was wearing a miniskirt. And he said to the, the person on reception, why are you letting her in? She's wearing a miniskirt too. And I look better in mine than she does in hers. Um, I would have to say, I feel that it's very likely that Mark would have done that because like my experience of him, he was very quick. He was very funny and he was often quite provocative. So uh, yeah, that was the kind of story I heard uh, before, before I met him. So I met him in London a few weeks before I left Ireland myself um, to go to university. I went over to London with a friend of mine called Damien Kerr. And again, I don't know if Damien knew Mark in Portrush. Damien went to Catering College and would have been closer in age to Mark. So they may well have known each other from Catering College days. Um, so we went to stay in London in his flat in Elephant and Castle. Uh, Damien was a kind of a bit of a, he was slightly on the run from his marriage. He'd had a, a kind of illicit affair with a man over the summer. Um, and I think was, you know, very soon moved to moved to England for, for good. Um, anyway, we rocked up at Mark's flat. He wasn't there. He left a key for us underneath the bin. And again, this was my, my kind of memory always of that flat. There was always a key under the bin. And I, like I, I was on Facebook earlier and somebody who I don't know talked about how they used to go and stay in his flat in, uh, in Elephant and Castle. But Mark had this a huge impact on my life, uh, absolutely huge impact on my life. He was the first out and proud gay person I ever met. Not the first gay person I met. It was a kind of huddle of the afflicted. I think I would describe us as um, who used to go out to the Derry Hotel in Portrush and to Kelly's and to what was various known, known as Chester's and Beachcombers, but is now back to being the Arcadia. Um, and maybe that makes it sound harsh, the huddle of the afflicted, because we did just have queer crack and there was certainly a, a high, largely amount of drink and drugs taken, but nobody was proud. Nobody, absolutely nobody that I knew at that time in my life was proud to be gay was happy about being gay. It was all secretive. Um, and then I met Mark and it was like you'd been in a dark room and somebody would switched the lights on. That's how different it was, my experience of meeting him. And it, it kind of transformed, it transformed how I felt about myself, you know? And so we arrived, I can't remember what day of the week was. Anyway, the next day, He'd been invited. He was involved in the um, Young Communist League. It was before he was General Secretary, um, but he was heavily involved. And he'd been invited to be part of this um, uh, discussion program called Daytime with Sarah Kennedy. Um, and it was about whether the royal family should be abolished. So me and Damien and Mark went on this um, TV program on whether the royal family should be abolished. And nearly everybody else thought the royal family was marvellous. And me and Mark thought it should be abolished. <laughs> and I was 18, you know, but he kind of being with him just gave me the confidence to speak up. And I think, you know, I was also at that age. And I'm like, if my granddad had seen that programme, he would have gone through the roof, you know, because I was very royalist, loyalist brought up. Um, so that was kind of my first experience of being on TV. And afterwards he took us to a, a gay bar, which was the first time I'd been in a gay pub. And it was just, I don't know, it was just thrilling. Everything about it was just thrilling. Um, and he explained all about the pink triangle and the black triangle and about gay history. And he was involved in just so much. And I just got, from that week, just got so much from just being around him and being around somebody that was from here, but that didn't have that shame, that didn't have that self-hate, 
and it was it was fantastic for me. And maybe I'll say a few more things about them later, but maybe that's perhaps enough for me to be going on with. That's so lovely. Thank you, Hilary. Um, yeah, it's, it's really, really lovely and valuable. And it's really one of the whole points of the history project to gather these stories and to gather these memories before they're lost, because there, there is an issue with queer history sort of slipping away from us um, whenever um, the time moves on. And just, I think that brings us really nicely on to um, somebody who was, I, I only found out this week, was interviewed at London Switchboard, the LGBT helpline. Um, so Mike Jackson, um, if you want to tell us a little bit about you, whenever you first met Mike, or sorry, whenever you first met uh, Mark. Sure. Uh, thanks for in inviting me to speak today. It's nice to see Sean there. Um, yeah, the first time I ever met Mark was um, 1983. Uh, I'd, I'd fairly recently returned to London uh, from a sojourn up north at, at, well, at university, where I'd been part of a group that set up um, North Staffordshire Gay Switchboard. Uh, so there I was back in London again, and uh, London Switchboard helped me uh, several years prior, previously to come out. Uh, and it was a way for me to kind of repay the debt that I felt like I owed them. And I was interviewed by two uh, young gay men, uh, one of whom was was Mark. And I just thought, oh, my God, who is this beautiful whirlwind of a, of a young man? Um, Mark then would have been about 23 years old. I'd have been, I'm six years older than Mark, so I'd have been about, uh, whatever that is, 29. Um, and... You know, it, 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 we just hit it off immediately. I started doing, I was accepted as a volunteer on Switchboard. Uh, I started doing shifts there and, and sometimes Mark and I started doing shifts together. So it was a remarkable service on the Switchboard. It was 24 seven and it was global. So literally we had uh, telephone calls from all over the world. You know, it's the only 24 seven Switchboard that there was. And of course it's all pre-internet this. So. A, a telephone helpline was literally a lifeline to you know hundreds of thousands of people, uh, and it doesn't surprise me there what Hillary said about uh, Mark was the first out uh, person that, that that she'd met because that was very much Switchboard's uh, attitude. I mean, it, 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 one of its roles obviously was to help people to come out. Probably its mo most important role, in fact. Um, and they very much did this through a, a, a political uh, understanding of, of what being gay was about, that, you know, there is nothing wrong with your homosexuality. What's wrong is homophobia. And that's nothing to do with you. That's that external to you. And certainly for me, I mean, that that was a, a, a hugely important thing. I, I, I'd come out kind of probably about 10 years previous in 1973. And uh, up until we fall in uh, gay switchboard, I absorbed everything. I thought I was mad. I thought I was sad and I thought I was bad. Uh, mad because the World Health Organization, right up until about 1990 something, uh, classified homosexuality as a mental illness. So Mark was not only illegal uh, and me, uh, but we were also uh, mentally ill as far as the authorities were concerned. Um, and Switchboard helped people like me to kind of reevaluate that and, and unlearn all that nonsensical stuff and turn it instead into a, a, a kind of wonderful liberation, really. And for me and for Mark, more certainly, coming out wasn't just about me kind of gaining uh, my own gay, gay liberation. Or what was the word that you used um, earlier on, Jude? It was... Uh, authentic self that's it yeah that's the modern way of saying it but it also for me everybody else's oppression slotted into place once i got a, a political grasp on the oppression of homosexuals coming through homophobia i began to think oh well maybe that's what racism is like for black people and maybe that's what sexism is like for, for women so actually it was a it was a baptism baptism of fire really 
and there's me and, and Mark kind of like in the crucible of it. It was, uh, they were exciting times, very exciting times. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Mike. Um, and that brings me on to um, just, I, I've, I've only spoken to you once and it's been on radio, but I, I feel like I know you from looking at you in photos and um, hearing your voice on various recordings. But Shan James um, is, she's just vivacious and lovely and I don't even know her, um, but I feel a real affinity with her. So she was raised in um, Wales in one of the mining villages and speaking Welsh. So I, I, th I think we'll have to ask what is happy birthday mark in welsh um so i'll come to you in a minute um but shan was really amazingly lovely portrayed in uh pride the movie as, as basically the sort of the catalyst um and the sort of bridge between the mining communities and the lgbt people she was she was the good trouble um to to seal another phrase so shan do you want to tell us a little bit about um about the mining communities, about what it was like at the time in Wales, and maybe your first recollections of Mark. Um, I mean, yeah, no star. Dioch, I'm a Kreutzer Ganez. Hi, you know, thank you for the lovely warm welcome. And I'd like to wish Mark Penbloid Hapis Young, I Mark. A very happy birthday to Mark. Uh, do you know what? When I think about our communities, it's those closed communities that Mike described. Uh, to our eternal shame, we didn't really think about anybody beyond the confines of our community. We lived lives that were based in, uh, you know, work traditions, trade union traditions, and making a living in Thatcher's Britain and keeping family in half together and watching people like my brothers and my cousins on YTS schemes and those important jobs that we'd grown up with, coal mining, steel working, dock working, railway workmen, all disappear and all change during those years. You know, we, 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 were, in, we were communities in flux. We were communities that were expected to change, but we didn't want to change. We didn't feel a need to change. You know, we were comfortable in our communities, but that made us insular in some ways because we thought that everything evil under the sun came from London. You know, that's where the government, the British government was based. Every decision that affected us that was negative was made there. And we had a huge sense of powerlessness that somehow or other we had no power. The trade unions were struggling. You know, we knew when Margaret Thatcher was elected that we were in for a confrontation and it was just a matter of time. So we were those communities that were expected to change, that were changing, and we hadn't made those networks or those links. But my community hadn't my family hadn't that Mike spoke about, about the affinities and what were, how much were we alike uh, rather than what made us different. And, you know, when LGSM came into our lives, you know, we, we'd been in this period of change, but to meet gay men, lesbian women who had been in a struggle, who had been in a fight and who'd proven that you could achieve things and that by standing together it, re it really brought it home to us so we we were looking for those affinities we were looking for those partnerships we were looking to make the links that would help us uh, overcome the situation we were in and i always say it wasn't a question of sexuality. It wasn't a question of, uh, you know, were you lesbian? Were you gay? Were you black? Were you white? Were you English? Were you Welsh? It was about, do you hate Margaret Thatcher? Do you hate this repressive government? If you do, 
that's fine by us. You know, you're a friend. And when I think about meeting Mark and meeting Mike and meeting other people, it was that the great thing about Mark for me was that he travelled in hope. He travelled in belief. He never, there was never a moment with Mark where he would turn around, or that I saw, where you turn around and say, this is a waste of time. Or perhaps we should be doing something else. He always believed that if you stood up and we were, count, and we were counted and we did our best, that we would eventually affect change. And, you know, I've been on picket lines with Mark. I've been at demonstrations. I've been at rallies. And he was always on what we called at the front, you know, front line, you know, front and centre. You know, and I hear that wonderful accent and I hear that wonderful voice rallying people, encouraging people. And when you talked about his flat in, in, in London, and, and again, we, we, we didn't have experience of London. I'd been to London once as an eight year old for a long weekend. And we'd gone to Buckingham Palace and we'd gone to see the changing of the guards uh, and we'd gone to Harrods. You know, we'd done all the, 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 the touristy type things. Didn't really know anybody who lived in London. But I remember going to his flat and what, you know, we didn't have flats like that in Britain, high rise flats or, you know, the lifts and, and the problems and, and all the things. I remember going to the flat and being taken next door to meet Mark's neighbour who was an elderly black lady. And we sat at her kitchen table and talked about what her life was like. And he was just as equally at home there as he was sitting at my kitchen table or sitting at the Enfoin and we had a pint. Or when we went to other people's homes in London uh, or, or, or Gays the Word or the Lesbian and Gay Centre in Cout Cross Street, Mark could fit in anywhere because he believed in other people and when he glowed with that belief and when he had that you know that encouragement and I've talked to young men who he was supporting I've talked to women who he worked with and they all talk about that beacon of light and hope and belief and if that's what I learned from Mark and I think that 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 you know he believed in his country, he believed in his nation, he believed in his history and the language and the culture of uh, just like I believed in those things in Wales for me and for my family and for him and his family. And that, that was the affinity. I'm wearing a necklace tonight. It's a really special necklace. It's raising money for Welsh Women's Aid, which I was the director for a while. And it's called Chopsy. And in Welsh, in Wales, we say that people are chopsy. They, they talk a lot, Jude. They're vo voluble. They express an opinion. In Wales, sometimes it's used in a derogatory way about women. Oh, she's a chopsy cow. You know, oh, she's got a right chops on her. But the whole thing is, you have to speak out. And that's what Mark encouraged me to do. And other people like Mike and jo Jonathan and Derek and Roy, they encouraged me to speak out and that my voice was just as, an imp as important as anybody else's. So that's what Mark achieved. He took all of those things that he learned in Northern Ireland, all that enthusiasm that Hillary talked about, all that standing on the front row, all that support and that ability to encourage others that Mike spoke about, he gave me a little bit of that. And I'm really proud of that. And when I think about Mark, that's what I think about. I think about that shining beacon. And he never, ever, ever travelled anywhere without hope and without belief in what he did. And, you know, that's good enough for me. That's so lovely. Thank you so much, Sean. Really, really amazing. Um, yeah, I want to say something off the back of that, which yeah, you know, I was actually going to come to you, Hilary. So, that yeah, be just what you were saying there, Shan, kind of really resonated because I think one of the things he was very good at was giving you courage, yes. giving other people courage, 
speak up and speak out. You know, so not that long. So I, I must have met would maybe be the kind of early to mid September 1984, and then I started university at the end the end of September, and I hadn't been at university like two minutes and. Um, Rugby Tory Council announced that they were banning gay workers. Um, and so there was going to be a demonstration in rugby um, against the council decision. And nobody else in Gay Sock wanted to get up um, at the student union and ask for the money for us to have a minibus to go to the demonstration. So I got up and, and spoke. And that's, I guess that was the thing, you know, even not, you know, I had them, I'd only had that week staying with him, but he was the kind of person that even when you weren't with him, I felt that kind of courage mm. and that you've got the right to your existence and there's nothing wrong with you. What's wrong is with them mm. and how they treat you. You know, I already had imbibed that from him and that has stood me so well you know throughout my life that that kind of just that that courage and and solidarity and speaking up and yeah that's been really powerful and that's actually the next time I saw him was actually on that demonstration in rugby um yeah so but the kind of yeah, no, I'll come to, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there for now. Yeah, um, uh, yeah Hilary, um, I, I was kind of interested to sort of see how you felt growing up in um, an area like Portrush, um, a really, really rural, isolated part of Northern Ireland, and that sort of transition to, um, like, London and that exposure to... Um, to all of these different people and this diversity and this just amazing life. Um, I, I know whenever I lived in London that, you know, yes, I could fit in there and I really, really loved it, but was I being true to my roots? And, you know, well, I, it, was, it was just a real, real challenge about, you know, what what is my identity? Am I... Um, Irish, Northern Irish, British, you know, wh where do I sort of fit in um, here? And, you know, one one reflection that uh, I just find really very, very sad, um, one person that I've spoken to who knew Mark um, from the period that you know, uh, that you know him, um, is a member of the LGBT community, but isn't out in Port Rush. So this person is the same age as Mark and has lived like the most amazing, lovely, wonderful life full of achievement and experiences. But it's now 2021 and they're still not allowed to be out. So I kind of want to know what you think about, you know, coming from here, growing up surrounded by um, a really, really hostile environment at times, you know, a hostile political environment, um, the, the, the police, um, the police raids um, on gay men, on Cara friends, phone diaries and things like that. And what it was like to go from that and that being your home to London and, you know, the vibrancy of that. So, uh, well, so I was, I actually, well, when I went to university, I was in Bristol. So I wasn't in London, I was in Bristol. And you know, in some ways you kind of go to England and you think it's going to be really different. And in many ways it was massively different. But at the same time, it was also, I was, I was the only out lesbian on the, the campus. Um, so it's the way the student accommodation in, in Bristol is kind of spread out about the place, but there was about 1500 students lived in one area um, of, of, um, of university accommodation, I was the only out lesbian in 1500 people, you know, and uh, the Christian Union were really active in the halls that I were in and they would come around trying to convert you. Um, in the end, I made this huge double women's symbol in bright red, edged with black, 
you know, and if they came and I would just t tell them to f off. Um, but it was, and when I was going to see, and then that whole thing about spelling, just about, about identity, I'd been brought up a Protestant, though I'd already kind of, I was already in favour of United Ireland before I left. Um, but you go to, you go to Britain, you brought up thinking you're British, you go to Britain. They, they care what you are, and it's not British, you know. <laughs> there's absolutely no, so no doubt amongst British people that anybody from the, either the north or the south of, of Ireland is Irish. Um, and I arrived, I'd only been there, I don't know, three or four days, and the Brighton bomb went off. And there was a lot, lot of hostility. Um, so I had that kind of hostility about being Irish. And then the hostility about being a lesbian. And so it was, yeah, complicated. But that's partly, there was also like real strength as well and solidarity with other LGBT people that you knew um, and a lot of support. Um, one of the things I was going to talk about was Pride. So the first Pride I went to was 1985, which is the one that finished as the film. Uh, you know, and I remember the the band, and I, uh, and I remember being with Mark and seeing Mark that day. And the next Pride was nineteen eighty six. Well, obviously, so the next Pride a year later, I also saw Mark at that Pride. In fact, I'm pretty sure I stayed with him. I either stayed with him the eighty five Pride or the eighty six, but I think it was the eighty six Pride I stayed with him. And I remember him coming into my room because he pulled asking if I had any poppers, which I always did have poppers. <laughs> so I gave him my supply of poppers. And the next Pride was 87 and the Mark Ashton Trust banner. Um, and I'd heard that he died. Um, we didn't get, I think the pink paper existed by then, but we didn't get it in Bristol and I didn't buy gay news. I, whether wrongly or rightly, I kind of perceived it as being much more of a gay man's um, paper. But I'd heard from somebody from Port Rush who'd been passing through Bristol that he he was dead. But I didn't I didn't want to believe it. And then seeing the banner, I actually could almost cry now because I just I cried and cried at him being dead and so young and. How much he achieved in, in the short life that he had and how awful it was that he went so, so quickly. So, yeah. Yeah, so there was, you know, there was, it was definitely better than being in Ireland in terms of the hostility. I couldn't, yeah, I, like, I couldn't wait to be away. I couldn't imagine staying in. I don't know how people have stayed, of my age, stayed and managed to do it. I mean, it. It was just inconceivable for me that I could be a lesbian and stay, stay in Ireland. I couldn't, like if I'd gone to university in Belfast, you know, I may as well have been at home still, you know, it's like everybody knows everybody, you know. So I, I couldn't wait to be away. But England isn't the kind of, you know, it wasn't the, it wasn't the kind of golden land of everything's fine. Um, it was easier, but it wasn't easy. And when I came out of watching that film Pride, I was with my friend um, Julie Mack, and we came out. And we had to go and we had to go and have cocktails because we were so traumatized remembering how everybody was just allowed to hate you, you know. And that was you were just uh, that you were just everybody's allowed to just hate you. Uh, thanks so much, um, Hilary, for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean the real. Um, yeah, Mike. What what I sort of want to ask you is about that that hatred for gay people, and on what I have studied about Mark and what I know about Mark is that because he felt that hatred towards him as being gay he felt an affinity with other people who were hated by mainstream society. So I kind of want to know a little bit more about what Mark thought about, you know, different classes and um, different races and, 
you know, that sort of what we would now recognize as intersectionality, um, but probably in the 80s was maybe thought of very, very differently. So I kind of just want to know a little bit more about what Marx politics are outside of just um, just the LGBT world. Mm. Well, uh, as as uh, he says so clearly in um, All Out Dancing in Delice, the video that we made at the, at the time, you know, it's no good fighting just for one community like the, the gay community. You need to fight for all communities. And, and that we really was the, 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 the bosom of, of Marx politics um what's interesting is is i mean i only met mark kind of in 1983 so it's quite it was the last four years of his uh, life um but he's he he wasn't always political and he certainly wasn't brought up in a political household uh and the story that we all have come to accept is his explanation was that his father fitted um redundant textile machinery because they, they originated in Lancashire where I'm from where there's lots of textile mills and uh, sometimes the textile mills would, would get more modern machinery in, and the old machine was still working but it was just a bit out of date and so his father would fit these machines in to countries like Bangladesh and when he was working in Bangladesh once, he invited Mark over and Mark went over, I think for quite an extended period, about three months. And it, it seems that was the epiphany for Mark. Up till that point in his life, he was a fairly carefree, uh, naughty, fun-loving, mischievous kind of geezer. Uh, very kind of trendy, lo loved his dancing, loved his shoes and his clothes and everything. But when he went to Bangladesh, he saw poverty on a scale that's, well, I'm, I'm sure I would feel the same myself. He, he saw poverty on a scale he'd never, ever witnessed before. You know, chill, homeless children on the streets begging. And it really did uh, affect Mark quite deeply that. And that's when he came back and became politicised. And uh, he, of his own volition, from what I can understand, uh, joined the British Communist Party, um, and very, very quickly. I mean, he, he, I mean, he was only twenty six when he died, but he he must have had such a crash course in reading about socialism and Marxism and so forth. You know, I mean, he he, he became general secretary of the Young Communist League in in a very f few years, uh, and he was a very bright man. Was Mark? He, you know, he. Yes, he was fun-loving, etc. But uh, there were times when he would just study at home and, and study and study and study to make to, to he, you know it was an obligation to him. He, you know, he was a, a cadre. He was a, 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 a to be a good communist and a, a, and a good Marxist. You have to read and you have to understand. Um, so that's where he was coming from, and and of course he, he like myself would put class as the overarching connection between all of us and i mean obviously other people may may or may not believe in that kind of politics but certainly mark did and and i did so he would never see that being gay was everything uh being gay and seeking gay liberation was only one uh, strand of the many kind of battles that we have to fight in the same way that we have to learn about you know, anti-racism and, and, and women's rights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so he, he was a multifaceted man like that. He was quite a modernist as well. I mean, he he wasn't really into kind of. Uh, there's a certain type of socialist who I call the hair shirt socialist. Uh, which are, uh, I, I completely stand in opposition to people like that. They're, they're, they're kind of miserableists who think that socialism, socialism is, is about everybody living in poverty and there's no wealth anymore. That's a lot of bollocks, yeah. What we want is we want everybody to be wealthy. That's what a socialist is, yeah. But not necessarily stinking rich, but have a good material standard of living and that should be the right of every human being on the planet. And that, and that was Mark, that's what he was part of. He was also um, a playful and cantankerous and really irritating. And sometimes he would back himself into a corner talking about politics. 
and he he would just become outrageous. He'd he'd get he he'd know he was backing into a corner, and like a, a, like any animal that's backed into a corner, he'd be up in the corner, just coming out with this utter nonsense to try and defend his case, and then little bugger, he'd just get you, and he'd just make everybody fall about laughing. And and it, including himself, he would just take the piss out of himself, and you'd move on, you know. And that that was very, it was very mercurial, was Mark in in that respect. I remember going down to Wales once, and this furious uh, argument between Mark on his own and about three or four other people in the minibus who were all in a Trotsky's party, and they were all having a big row about uh, Poland because the Polish government was breaking the strike, the communist uh, Polish government, by exporting coal. But the Polish coal miners were actually donating some of the wages to the strike fund. So the government, the so-called communist government was breaking the strike, but the actual Polish coal miners were supporting the strike. And it led into this just furious uh, discussion. Um, and again, it, Mark just eventually realised he was he was on a hide into nothing, and just he he just made a wise crack, and just everybody just fell about laughing, and he moved on. So he was never a man who had rancour or bore a grudge against people. I think Mark's attitude would be life's too short for that. Yeah. yeah. And had he lived, who knows what, where, and what he'd be doing uh, today? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jude. Thanks so much. Um, Shan, I think one of the really lovely, um, uh, I think one of the really, really bittersweet parts of the film for me is the bit in Pride the movie. Now, I, I realise that it is dr dramatised, but um, where they're raffling off a tin of bee, uh, peas or beans. Corned beef. Corned beef. Okay, well, I'm vegetarian, so maybe I'm sort of subliminally um, suppressing that. Um, but I kind, I kind of want to know a little bit about um, about Wales. So, different people have said that um, Welsh people have memories like elephants. I think it was Mike who said that. And basically, you know, loads of the comments that have come in um, on the petitions and on uh the local giving site and actually from uh people like lisa parr um who worked with mark on switchboard it's just all of these welsh people who have this really lovely memory of mark and you know in a, in a lot of ways it seems stronger than people in portrush but well maybe they're just more voluble about it and so if you could just tell us a little bit more about um sort of mark in wales well, one of the things that we were determined to do when we had that letter, it was, and you know, when you talk about what's true in the film and what's not true in the film, uh, you know, th there is what they call dramatic license, isn't there? Uh, they told us this from the beginning and, and Mike will say, you're going to hear your words, but you might hear a different person saying them. And we'll uh, move the sequence of events slightly because it will make the flow of the story better um and and there will be things that may not necessarily have happened in that order or at that time and the other thing they told us that if they'd had everybody in the film and they had you know done it as a day-by-day -day account of our relationship the film would have been 14 and a half hours long with a cast of thousands um, and obviously that wasn't wasn't practical so Mark's uh, interaction with our support group was was a wide one uh, um, because we had people in the community who uh, were communists um, who knew Mark from the communist party uh, they'd campaigned with Mark there were people who you know the lovely Cliff Grist uh, it, it, you know I think Cliff is most probably one of the most uh, under-portrayed characters in the film. He was played beautifully by Bill Nye, But, you know, the difference 
that actually having the opportunity to express himself as a gay man had on Cliff, I saw that at first hand. And yet Cliff's family would not accept that he was gay. He was a minor in his 50s and his mother was still saying things like, my Cliffy isn't like that. He's a good boy. You, you know, and, and so we were seeing people changing and Mark was interacting with all these different groups of people. And he was bringing, you know, and just like other people had friends. Uh, I, I have a series of postcards from Mark. Uh, that's what we have to remember. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have mobile phones. We didn't have emails. Having a relationship with somebody in that time, um, long distance, actually meant that you had to do a lot of letter writing and you had to send a lot of postcards. Uh, and I've got a lovely collection of postcards from various friends and uh, guessing who visited Ireland and with, with uh, Mark. Um, and people like Derek when he went to Russia and Poland, etc. Um, and I remember being so shocked when I discovered that Derek was a Maoist. And and I just said, what? 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 What are you talking about, lad? You know, <laughs> put yourself together. You know, be a communist, but be a sort of a you know our sort of communist, a communist that we understood in that old socialist tradition of, of Wales. So we were all being exposed to different experiences and different people, but, but LGSM took that outside of our community, the mining community, because we were introducing our friends from London to our families, to other friends within the communities. And we saw that ripple effect go out. And the ripple effect that came back in was that people were seeing the affinities and not those things that made us different. And th that was lovely to see. And recently, very, very recently, we had the honour in Ontfoyne Miners Welfare Hall. Uh, the First Minister came to visit. And, you know, First Ministers come and do this sort of thing, don't they? During elections, they look for places to have their pictures taken. And it's a pandemic and he's not allowed to go into anywhere where there's a lot of people. But he specifically asked that if he could come and visit Onchloin. And he specifically asked to see how Wells display an exhibition on, the, you know, the politics of the Delice Valley. And he actually spent some time hearing about Mark and hearing about the Wiener. And, and our plaques up to them both in the welfare hall. And there's the story spreading again. Uh, Juliet Gillard remarked to me, I'm name dropping now, about mm. how she'd watched the film and really enjoyed it. But what no one knew was Juliet Gillard's father is from Resolven, which is actually a community that's within our support group area. And we had no idea that her family... Uh, uh, it's a very well-known link to Barry. So we're making those links and those affinities still. So the film and the relationship with LGSM is still rippling out, is still creating conversations, is still encouraging people to talk about what the affinities are and what makes us so similar. And I think that I think that's going to last forever. I know that sounds a little over dramatic, but I always say to Matthew Waters and I say to Stephen Beresford, Pride is a film that will become as beloved in this country as things like the Tickfield Thunderbolt and Kind Hearts and Coronets. Mm -hmm. And somewhere, someone will be watching that film at 11 o'clock at night when there's nothing else on TV and they'll switch on and they'll say, oh, Pride's on. We'll watch that because invariably people tell me we laugh, we cry and we are left feeling at the end of that film. We're left feeling good. We're left, we're left feeling hopeful. We're left feeling 
we can make that better world that Mark talked about, that more hopeful, positive world, you know, where we realise that politics could change the world. So our community that, that LGSM came into was ready for change, was in change, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to whitewash it, you know, pardon the statement. Of course people made silly comments, like, you know, one of my relatives made a silly comment like, will I be safe with all those gay men? A bit, you know, why? Are you so irresistible? And it's actually then people think about it. Well, I am being a bit, you know, what do I know about gay men, lesbian women? What do I know about their struggles? And all of a sudden, you know, what made us similar? Do you know my biggest shock was? actually making the links between all my friends in London and their political lives. Because it isn't an accident isn't it, that LGSM had this strong socialist core, that they had this belief in trade unionism, that they had this belief. Because when you look at where there were all those interlinks of people who've been in university together, who work together on gay switchboard, who are in the Young Communist League, the Young Socialist League, all those links were there. And it brought together people who were like-minded and the people in our community, you know, when my next door neighbour stood on the doorstep and said, when are those lovely boys coming to stay again then, Sean? Oh, they're so polite. They always say hello to me. Now, she didn't give us stuff that these were gay young men or lesbian young women. They were nice and polite and they took the time to stop. And that's what was great about it. And I think that's what the film was. We were this little change with that ripple effect. And I think the film has played a big part of it. Did we live in the same village? No, we lived in several different villages. Did we live in the same valley? No, we lived spread out against, you know, on three valleys. Was there a pit down the bottom of the road in the, as is portrayed in the film? No, our men had to travel a long way to find work as the collieries shut and contracted. And did we march back into work behind a banner? You wouldn't have got one of our support group to march behind a trombone and celebrate going back into work at the end of the strike only at the point of a gun because we didn't want to go back. We didn't feel that we'd won the battle. We didn't think that we'd been treated fairly. And history has been on our side about that. We were badly treated. And at that time, the partnerships we made, the, the comrades we found, and where we got our support, whether it was from LGSM, whether it was BAME communities, whether it was from the women's movement, we learnt an awful lot. And I, I like to think that those communities learnt from us as well. But my abiding memory is getting up one morning in Derek Hughes's home and sitting around for breakfast and my daughter and my son are there eating their cereal and there is a young gay man who's come home with Derek the night before and I often wonder what the hell did that young man make of sitting down to breakfast in this openly gay home with a minor, his wife and two ch children all chattering in Welsh and nobody blinked, you know. And at the end of it all, my daughter said quite winningly to this young man, Luca, his name was, Luca, do you think you could take us down the park now? And the young man goes, park? Well, the other one, when we stayed last time, took us down the park and bought us an ice cream. <laughs> Shut up. You know, you don't. and that's where my children then, the next generation, and their children, my granddaughter and things, it's, this is their lives. This is the reality of our communities. 
Our communities are made up of many and varied people, different sexualities, different backgrounds, different colors, different languages, different creeds. I'm hopeful that my grandchildren are going to grow up in a world, a hell, a hell of a mess at the moment, mind you, I've got no excuses for it, but they're going to grow up and when my nephew says to me, oh, we've got three or four blokes, boys in our rugby team who are gay. What a difference, isn't it? From the time when young gay men had to hide the fact that they were gay. And, you know, we're going to have to see that in football. And we're going to have to tackle racism in football. We're going to have to tackle, you know, and I'm going to say those dreaded things. You know, we're going to have to look at how thing how communities get along but we've done our little bit and mark was you know an lgsm and mike and jonathan and derek and roy and reggie and ray we were all part of that you know david donovan and margaret and karen and david all of our friends in this community we were it's an exciting time it was a special time but I'm proud to say that my friends in 1984, 85, are still my friends. And I think that's a hell of an achievement for any community, isn't it? I really love that, Sean. Thanks so much. Um, you, you mentioned uh, David Donovan. So I had emailed Di. He's oh. in the process of retiring, but he sent me his speeches from um oh, I, right you need to tell me how to pronounce it properly what do you call the hall on Chloin. on on Chloin. Chloin. on oh, well done jude that's Thank the you. hardest one that double l Chloin. <laughs> on Chloin. um but i i, I just it, it's 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 really just i mean if you think that pride is made up um these speeches that Di has done are just i mean they're basically like historic love letters to uh, you know in solidarity with somebody that you just have an affinity with um but it ends with your life though all too brief was momentous and meaningful not only to the miners in south wales then but to all lgbtq people today for the protection they enjoy in law the support in the workplace as well as being valued as part of mainstream society, came out of your charisma then. For all of us who were fortunate to have known you in the mining communities of South Wales, you are remembered still. You have our gratitude and you will live on. This is your legacy, Mark. This plaque here in the West Coalfield of South West Wales, we'll delete that bit and put in Port Rush in a couple of years will serve as a testament to it, along with the lasting memory of your actions within LGSM to help others in struggle. So I thought that was really, really lovely. He was really, really keen to take part in some way.